Now, let me ask you this question. Which of these two do you think is more likely to happen? Should they be equally likely to happen? I guess it's easier to start up with data. Uh, or, or wait, you cannot look there because I'm not on the right page. So uh, what I will tell you is this is, this, this is actually more likely to happen than this. So let me just show it to you with the data that's available here somewhere. Uh, K meson, decay mode. Yeah, when you look at the two pion decay modes, the decay into two charged pions is more likely, about twice as like, twice, is that the right number? Well, it's more likely than the two neutral pion decay modes. As in, this is more likely than this. And I can kind of give you a conceptual description why. This over happening, the, the way this happens, requires additional constraints on it that's not here. Um, so here, the, these two started out as uh, two anti-aligned particle, started out with a spin zero. And it ends up with a spin zero, and this ends up with a spin zero. So all of that is fine, you don't have to change anything. Here, so this has one spin, this has another spin. This ha produces two that has one spin, another spin, and those spins have to match up so that you end up with a spin zero and end up with a spin zero. And the, so, um, in fact, if we had more time to spend with the isospin, that's actually what we do in one of the nodes. With the isospin uh, formalism, you can actually predict the ratio of the branching rate. rate. Just, you know, you don't know nothing about nuclear physics, but just on the idea that their spins have to match, or their isospin has to match, which is w whichever. <laughs> but those symmetrization requirements, you can kind of figure out that this is more likely to happen than this. And that's why in this data sheet, they are often expressed in these terms, as in fraction, branching ratios, because that's an experimentally testable fact that can be used to determine spin of something. Um, okay, so that's the third one, I guess. Oh, oh, and I should address one more thing. So uh, it kind of half came up when we were about to talk about um, um, about to talk about this vertex here. So, okay, I have down quark. What's uh, uh, another version of down quark? What's another version of down quark? Strange quark, right? Okay, so this describes down quark turning into up quark. So shouldn't it also describe strange quark turning into charm quark? But here, we actually saw strange quark turning into up quark, not a charm quark. And what this is, is um, this is uh, the idea of skewed generation. So I gave you these families of quarks as though they were um, like these families, these types, these flavors for all interactions. It turns out what counts as a charm quark or uh, rather, what count, I forget which is which. Um, <laughs> so the, you can think of it as two axes being slightly misoriented. So if you have an interaction involving, let's say, strange quark, then um, so in the weak interaction, um, so how, so the, these two are supposed to couple together in, let's say, strong interaction, then, um, sort of the basis that counts as these are skewed, so that there is some coupling between, in between generations from strange quark to up quark. It's a feature of, it's an experimentally measured parameter in standard model. Um, let's not go any more than that because I only have three minutes. 